This is a story of murder and the thoughts that go through one's head after losing someone close. Could I have done something to prevent this? Did I do or say something that led to this? We will avenge a grieving father and bring a small amount of justice to this unjust wasteland. Our sad story begins at Abernathy Farm. If we head to the most northerly transmission tower, we find three farmers in the Tato fields. New here? Well, if you've got anything worth trading, you can talk to me. What have you got? It ain't a lot, but I've got a few basic supplies. Ammo, meds, that sort of thing. How is the trade with Diamond City? Good, when my husband actually gets around to doing it. That is, if no one raids the farm first. Why do you think I'm selling ammo and meds? You can't protect yourself? The Commonwealth will swallow you right up. Next to Connie is her daughter, Lucy Abernathy. Here for work? We could use some help picking melons if you've got some spare time. I'll give you caps for any you can bring me. You look like you have a pretty successful farm here. We'd like to think so. Having Clarabelle helps. Free fertilizer, as Daddy would say. Whatever saves caps. Clarabelle? Who's that? Claire is our Brahmin. I like to consider her just as much a part of the family as Maisie. She's our cat, in case you were going to ask about her too. And next to Lucy is her father, Blake Abernathy. That's close enough, stranger. We're a peaceful farm. We don't want any trouble. It's okay. I'm friendly. Not looking to cause any trouble. If you say so, but be warned, we're armed here, so don't try anything. Let me tell you, farming ain't easy. Out in the field all day, every day, and every minute of it, spent watching your back. Gotta be careful. Never know who you can trust these days. Won't argue with that. Blake Abernathy, you new to the Commonwealth? Yes. And no. It's a long story. Either way, good to see a new face. How about you? Ever think about work in the land? What do you need to start up a farm? Well, my father would have told you it's the three L's. Land, labor, and love. You gotta have land to work, you gotta put in a full day's labor, and you gotta love what you do. Anyone who doesn't ain't gonna last long. Word of advice, though. If you do start up a farm, be ready to deal with the raiders. Why do all the hard work when you can just take what you want at gunpoint? So stop crying about it and stand up for yourself. Lady... You must be new to these parts. You don't stand up to raiders. Not if you value your life. Last time those raiders hit us, my daughter Mary tried to stand up to them. Now she's buried out back of the house. Only 21 years old, and they shot her down without a thought. That's why we need the Minutemen back. And the sooner, the better. We have an option to be incredibly heartless towards this poor man, if we choose to say... If your daughter was that stupid, she got what she deserved. You're a real piece of work, aren't you? Get the hell off my land! And don't show your face here again. He stops talking to us, and we don't get his quest. Alternatively, we can say... From what I've seen, nobody out here's got it easy. Yeah, well, that don't help us sleep any easier. There's nothing worse than losing a child. Believe me, I know. I'm sorry to hear you say so. I don't have much to offer, but those raiders that killed Mary, they took her locket too. It's been in Connie's family for generations. If you could get it back, it'd mean a lot to us. Do you know where they're coming from? Yeah, pretty sure I do. One of them mentioned Olivia while they were here. My guess is they're holed up in that old USAF station. And we begin the quest, returning the favor. This is a Minuteman quest, but we don't have to be a member of the Minutemen to do it. If we complete the quest, as a way of saying thank you, the Abernathy family joins the Minutemen and we have access to their settlement. But first, we need to bring this family some much-needed closure. Just north of Thicket Excavations, and south along the road of the Robotics Disposal Ground, we find an abandoned pre-war United States Air Force Observation Tower, USAF Satellite Station Olivia. Now, there are two raiders here, and one raider dog. However, it's quite possible to find them all dead when we arrive. You saw me discover this place for the first time, and yet, we'll see that everyone is dead. Heading to the shack on the ground, we see that these raiders are mad lads, putting screwdrivers and toasters. What won't they do? Just outside the shack is their attack dog, Dead. Behind the satellite dish, we find a ramp that leads all the way to the top. Here we find a floating pod. Inside the pod, we find one ammo box. And just outside on the catwalk is the second raider, also dead. 
Now, it's also possible to find them all alive, but there are two reasons they could be dead. The first is that two bloat flies spawn really close to this installation. So close that sometimes they drift on over and attack the raiders. This is why we found that one raider's body so close to the fence. And the other reason is that sometimes we get charged by a mole rat. But not just any mole rat, this mole rat had proximity mines strapped to its back. I'm not sure how these raiders died, I didn't see it happen. But when I explored it this first time, I didn't see the flies and I didn't see the mole rat. I'm assuming the raiders died to both of those threats. At any rate, when explored, we can climb down from the satellite dish and head over to the bunker. Inside, we see an armor workbench, a couple of lockers to loot, some jet and dirty water lying on a filing cabinet, and a door that leads to the satellite station. Now, this character is well over level 30. You've seen me use her in many of my videos. I made her because I'm uncomfortable with stealth and melee and I wanted to get better. I typically butcher my stealth attacks, but doggone it, I don't have an excuse anymore at this character's level, so I'm gonna do my very best to be as sneaky as possible. Sneaking on down, we can disable a laser tripwire right at the door. In the next room, we don't see anyone, so let's go ahead and hack the advanced locked guard terminal sitting on a desk. Inside, we find three options. The first, check-in log. We see that on October 22nd, the day before the bombs dropped, a slew of military personnel checked in. First Lieutenant Williams, Captain Johnson, Chief Master Sergeant Applegate, Senior Master Sergeant Ritchie, Technical Sergeants Cooper and Cummings, Staff Sergeants Miller, Winters, and Hicks, and Senior Airman O'Malley. We find them listed on the check-in log, but we don't see a check-out log. Could they all still be here? In the next one, we see Daily Briefing. Number one, the safety and security officer will be upgrading equipment in the coming months, but this does not mean maintenance duties cease. Continue normal work schedules. Number two, the lower storage room requires fumigation for pests, specifically cockroaches. Extermination commences at 0900 on the 25th of October this year. All personnel are required to vacate substation levels for the duration of the procedure. And number three, due to the high volume of signal intercept traffic, intel officers will be on site daily until further notice and will require access to the intel room. So the purpose of this station was to intercept Chinese communications. And it sounds like this was a full house the day the bombs dropped. So many people checking in the day before, and I noticed that the intel officers would be in the intel room. There's a closet in the wall right to the side of this monitor. Here we just find some purified water in a drawer. Heading out and turning right, we see the door open to the intel room. This is the door we opened with the terminal. On a desk in the middle of the room, we find a copy of US Covert Operations Manual. Tiptoe through the tulips permanently more difficult to detect while sneaking. We also find a mini nuke, and as we were expecting, we find the skeletons of military personnel on the ground. There appears to be no damage to this room, but since the door was locked, I think we can presume that the nuclear apocalypse triggered a lockdown and locked these poor guys in this room. Near to the bodies is the end of dungeon steamer trunk, and inside quite a lot of ammunition. We find a novice locked safe with randomized loot inside, and a big duffel bag lying against some lockers. Heading out and turning right, we see two paths before us. Peering through a window, we see an attack dog resting and another raider walking to the left. Making sure my Pip-Boy light is off, we sneak around the corner to see that the raider is almost here. Stepping back quickly, we wait for him to round the corner and then... Don't it! Aw, oh, come on! How did that happen? How did that happen? We saw him coming around the corner. How did he teleport behind me? Disappearing at oh! oh, I know you're here. Well, after that epic failure, which I'm not sure if it was my fault or not, that almost seemed like a glitch. We can continue to explore. Heading back to where we were, we can continue left down the hallway and round the corner. Down the hallway, we can turn left into the bathrooms and loot a first aid kit on the wall. And on the ground by one of the sinks, we see two dismembered hand bones. 
along with a pair of handcuffs. Could this mean that the military personnel here had kidnapped someone or otherwise imprisoned someone and that that person managed to free himself by chopping off his own hands? Was it a Chinese spy? Maybe one that they found within their own ranks, whom they managed to apprehend and handcuff in this bathroom before the bombs dropped. Without much else in this bathroom to explore, we can head out and go down the hallway. The door leads us to a catwalk overlooking a large room. Turning right, we find a novice-locked chem box with some chems inside and a tool case, but it leads to a dead end, so turning around, we can go all the way around and then down the ramp to the ground. We find a number of containers to loot and a big open door to the north. I managed to attract their attention while looting. This time, I'm gonna redeem myself. Crouching down and waiting till they come in to investigate. You hear that? Oh, 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 no. No. With that, we clear the site of raiders and kill the gang leader, Akak. Akak is another military reference. This is British slang from the 1930s and 40s that acts as an abbreviation for anti-aircraft. This came from a spelling alphabet used by British Army signalers, where the letter A was vocalized as Ak. Uh, there is one more terminal in here, but there's not much here. We find three options, all of which are offline. Satellite dish status, data stream status, database network, all offline. Near to the terminal, we find a fusion generator with a fusion core inside, and then heading through the door before we go up the stairs, we can turn left. Here we find an overdue book, which we can turn in at the Boston Library for a magazine. And on the ground next to some lockers, we see a teddy bear smoking a cigar, wearing an army helmet. My kind of guy. Next to him is an ammo box. This room then connects to the one where we killed all of those raiders. Heading through, we can turn right, where we can turn left into another room. Here we find two human skeletons, one of which is in a barrel. I'd have a hard time explaining this if the skeletons are pre-war, so my bet is that they must have been raider victims from long ago. Heading out, we find another skeleton next to a Nuka-Cola machine. There's some jet right next to his hand. And at the end of this room, right next to a door, we find a red toolbox, within which we find the locket. The nearby door is locked with a novice lock. Creeping inside, we see some rad roaches. These must descend from those that infested the room before the bombs dropped. The extermination was scheduled for the 25th, two days after the bombs dropped, so it sadly never happened. We can take advantage of some oil on the ground to burn them up. Inside, we find a wooden crate with some randomized loot inside. And in one corner next to some radioactive toxic barrels, we see some right away and some 10 millimeter ammunition. In the northeastern corner of the room, we see a small table with an instrument case. Inside, we find the Intel room key. So here's another option to open that room if we don't have the ability to hack the terminal yet. We find yet another army skeleton here. This place really was full the day the bombs dropped. And finally, we find a first aid kit tucked between two barrels in the northwestern corner. When done, we can retrace our steps to leave the facility. Back at Abernathy Farm, we can head on over to Blake to tell him of our success. I've got that locket back for you. You serious? That's great news. Connie's gonna be speechless. I'm sure she'll go lean on her prices after what you've done. And feel free to use our workshop. Least we can do. Blake told me what you did for us. For Mary. I know it's not much, but any trading you want to do, I'll go easy on the price. Uh, let me know if there's anything you want to take a look at. How are you holding up? Thanks to you. Better. Mary was a good kid. She had fire in her. I can't tell you how many arguments we had. <laughs> that girl hated rules, and believe me, I had plenty. All those rules are probably what pushed her. Believe me. Not a day goes by when that thought doesn't cross my mind. You did your best. Did I? What's the best you can do in a world like this? You only wanted to keep her safe. Ain't that the truth? And look where it got me. Do you regret it? All the rules? I'd say sure, but who knows? Without those rules, maybe something worse happens. The only thing I regret is not being able to save her. We knew the risks of having kids these days. And we took them. But it was worth it. I won't argue that. Anyway, enough. I'm sure you got plenty of your own thoughts to deal with rather than listen to mine. But like I said, if you need something, just let me know. 
It's not every day a stranger comes along and helps us out the way you did. So it seems like Connie partly blames herself, and the sole survivor has the option to be pretty judgmental, to blame Connie's family rules for encouraging Mary to act out, which led to her death. But I don't know if I buy that. Now, I do understand that when parents are so overprotective that they become overbearing, that these rules can feel like a stranglehold on a child. And when the child becomes a teenager or grows up into a young man or woman, he or she can become resentful and can act out as a way of getting back at their parents. I get that. But I also think that the opposite is true. If one's parenting style is too relaxed, I think a child can very easily become spoiled. A child may not learn that there are consequences for behaviors. In this situation, I see a child that hasn't had enough discipline being more likely to get up in the face of a raider pointing a gun at him or her. This is a kid who doesn't understand consequences for behaviors yet. He was never disciplined as a child. He doesn't get that his confrontational behavior could lead to his own pain. But it's always difficult to second guess yourself in a situation like this. Can Connie really take responsibility? Responsibility for the death of her own daughter? Could she and her husband have done anything to prevent it? Because I think it's also true that kids are more than what parents raise them to be. Kids are born with their own personalities. I see that in my own family. Both of my children are doing things and have certain behaviors that neither my wife or I ever taught them. These are completely unique to them. Children will grow up to become teenagers or young adults that have different world philosophies, different outlooks, respond to things differently despite how they were raised. At some point, we just have to remember that people are individuals. We don't always have control over them. We can't always guide their actions, predict what they're going to do. Maybe the only one who could have prevented Mary's death was Mary herself, by being a little wiser when a gun is pointed at her face. But of course, the only people that are to blame for her death are the raiders who murdered her. Sure, we could spend hours guessing about what we could have done to prevent her death, what she could have done to have survived that situation, but at the end of the day, the raiders are the ones guilty of that murder and they should take full blame. I admire the defiance and the boldness of people like Mary, but I think that that kind of backbone and boldness needs to be used wisely, at the right time, under the right circumstances. I don't think there's any shame in adopting Blake's attitude, shrewdly agreeing to placate the raiders as long as they're in power so that he can survive so that someday he may be alive to witness the raiders' demise, or to bring those raiders to justice. That's a far better outcome than the one that Mary chose. Mary was completely right. She didn't do anything morally wrong. She just chose to stand up for goodness at the wrong time. We find her grave behind Abernathy Farm. It's a small grave with a simple cross. Her parents have put one bouquet of flowers on top. So in my game, after I took on Abernathy Farm as a settlement, I decided to make a more fitting resting place for Mary. Now I had to use mods and use the console in order to do this because the grave is outside the bounds of the settlement. But in my game, I managed to put the name Mary on her cross and her age, 21. I then set out more flowers, some lit candles, and a teddy bear. And at the very base of her cross, I put her locket. I figured it was something the Abernathys would have appreciated, and it's really the best tribute I can give to someone who was so brave and so just, but sadly, at the wrong time. What are your thoughts on Mary Abernathy and her tragic story? Do you feel that her parents are somehow to blame? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a new shirt in the shop, folks. Build mass with sass with Sunset Sarsaparilla. That's right, you can now sport your love for everyone's favorite soft drink beverage from Fala New Vegas on a shirt, a hoodie, a mug, and in a wide range of colors. You can find a link to the shop in the description, or you can click here. Thanks for watching, folks. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.